Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's my pleasure today to welcome uh, Kath Knope, who many of you know. Um, those of you who don't, uh, she has a long history of writing compilers for failed computing companies. <laughs> <laughs> we, were going over, <laughs> we were going over to dinner last night. It was really pretty, pretty amazing, the number of supercomputing companies that came and went over the history. Uh, then she went to work for uh, the DEC Research Lab, which became the Compact Research Lab, which became the HP Research Lab, which is now the Intel Research Lab. So. <laughs> You know, if I was at Intel, I think I'd be a little nervous at this point. <laughs> but uh, she's going to give us a talk today about uh, T-Streams, which is a new parallel programming model. So I haven't read the newspaper today. If there's any news about Intel, maybe you could tell me. <laughs> So this is uh, T-Streams. T stands for tagged. Um, and um, in some of the transitions that I made, I lost some of my team, as you can see here. Um, I should also add Jeff Lowney to this list, I think. Um, OK, why T-Streams? Why another parallel uh, language? Where are we today? Um, the idea here is that it's very hard to see this way. I'll try this. Um, we have serial languages and we have explicitly parallel languages. Um, the, uh, in the serial languages, the software has to reason about um, parallelism. And there are two big problems there. One is overwriting, and the other one is arbitrary serialization. Um, in explicitly parallel languages, um, the user has to reason about parallelism. And furthermore, they're typically embedded in serial languages, which have the problem of overwriting and arbitrary serialization. Um, and so they're not appropriate for uh, wide-scale adoption. So I probably don't have to do this with this audience, but um, what's the issue with overwriting and serialization? Um, Suppose your problem, your abstract problem, requires some partial ordering where, um, whoops, let's go back, uh, where you have uh, some task A, which has to be done before B and C, which can be done in either order, um, followed by a task D. Uh, you have to write this in some specific uh, arbitrary serial order, so you write A, B, C, and D. Uh, and then you want to execute uh, B and C concurrently, and so you have to determine if this ordering is okay. Um, but you might have had uh, overwriting over here. So to figure out whether A of J in C really refers to A, you have to do some analysis of this stuff. And we've been doing decades of this, <laughs> and, um, and this, you know, there's a lot of interesting work here, and it's uh, it's very good work. But uh, we'd like to try something new. Uh, so the idea, the goal of T-Streams is to raise the level of programming just a tiny bit. And the tiny bit is to avoid the overwriting and the arbitrary serialization on the one hand from the serial languages, but also avoid the need to reason about parallelism um, for explicitly parallel languages on the other. Uh, so how do we do this? Typically, uh, or often, uh, parallel languages provide for the user some kind of knobs and handles uh, to help control what's going on underneath in the, parallel, um, in the parallel world. And this is quite a different philosophy. We're viewing this as an interface. Um, and an interface design is quite different from providing knobs and handles. Uh, so on the one side of the interface, we'd like the domain expert. The domain expert knows everything there is to know about finance or genomics, um, but has no interest in parallelism or tuning. Um, and the tuning expert might be a person or it might be a runtime system or a static analysis. Uh, and they have no interest in finance, um, except their own maybe. Um, but they are very interested in performance. Um, and so this interface 
must make explicit only what the domain expert actually knows, um, nothing about uh, things they're not interested in and they don't know, but it has to also contain exactly what the performance expert uh, needs to know. And I should say explicitly that the domain expert and the performance expert could well be the same person, just at a different time during the development. So we start with the, uh, the problem, the application problem, and we're going to end up with an actual distribution and schedule. And T streams in the middle is supposed to separate um, what's above this interface and what's below the interface. So above the interface, um, we're concerned about the serial code, semantic correctness, constraints required by the application, um, and not any of these things that are below the interface, which is the architecture, the actual parallelism, issues of locality, overhead, load balancing, distribution and scheduling, all the stuff that we in this room have probably spent our lifetime worrying about. And, um, but we don't, want, uh, we don't want that stuff to appear above. So the, uh, the outline of the talk is basically starting out with what is T-Streams and how does the domain expert see it? Uh, that, I wasn't supposed to hit that one. Okay. <laughs> uh, the second part is given something in this interface, what is the flexibility provided um, to the performance expert to worry about all of these things? Uh, and finally, something about the current implementation. Um, so I'm starting out with, I have a, a bunch of examples to illustrate a few different things here. Uh, this one, just to to show the, the basic idea. The idea is that we think, um, uh, you know, we draw flow charts on the, on the board to explain our application to our uh, colleagues. Uh, so we want to start with something of that nature, and then we need to make it precise. So we need to add exactly enough to make it a precise um, specification and a flexible one. Uh, so this example is office surveillance. Uh, so when you go into a major office building and you see a bunch of cameras on the uh, uh, on the desk of the person, the reception uh, desk, um, it's sort of that kind of thing. Um, so one thing you want to do is background subtraction. Say if the camera pointed at some uh, corner and there's a chair and a plant, um, you don't care about the chair and the plant. It's going to be in there in every image. Uh, you just want to know the people passing by, so you want to subtract out the background. So. Um, the first thing we need to ask in developing a T-Streams program is what are the operations in this program? In this example, we simply have one operation. Um, that's not typical. Um, the second question is what are the inputs and outputs of these operations? So we have producer-consumer relations. Uh, this is a computation, and these are data structures. Uh, we have the background image, and we have uh, the current image, which may have something other than the background in it. Um, and we want to produce just the stuff that's in the foreground. Uh, so, so far this looks a lot like what you might talk to your uh, neighbor about. Uh, the next question is, how do you distinguish among the instances of these? There are instances of the foreground image. There are instances of the background image. We're going to have instances of this uh, computation. Uh, one thing to uh, notice is this is not uh, a streaming application or thread-based application where this thing uh, sits in some particular place and data streams through it. To get the kind of performance we're interested in, uh, we're going to have many different instance of instances of these, and they're going to be placed um, and scheduled uh, independently. Not necessarily independently, but differently. Um, so we're uh, trying to say, oh, um, how do we distinguish among these instances? So um, for each camera, we're going to have a, a background. That doesn't change per image. It's only per camera. Uh, the image is from a particular camera and a particular uh, image. And this background subtraction task um, is distinguished from other tasks by, again, a camera number and a camera number and an image number. And the foreground image is also identified by the camera number and the image number. Okay, so we know how to distinguish them, but we want also the specific instances. Uh, so if you have four cameras, you're, then each camera number is going to be a number from one to four. 
Um, and if you have a stream of images, then each, uh, for each camera, there are specific images that, um, that arrive. And so this tells us this um, uh, triangle here, we, we call it a tag, um, is going to tell us the exact set. It's not a type. It's, um, it's the exact number of instances. Um, and for each uh, camera number, image number, pair in here, there is going to be a, a specific instance of the background subtraction um, task. So one way to think about this is it's kind of like control flow. If you think of a, uh, a loop nest, you might have IJK loops. Uh, as you're going through that, you're computing another, tr each time you go through it, you're computing another instance of the triple, IJK. But in addition, in that world, you're also saying, do the work now. You know, when you compute another triple, you then do the body of the loop. What this is saying is, um, this is telling us what the triples are, but it's leaving until later when we're going to execute them. Okay? Um, I'll go through an example that focuses a little more on those uh, afterwards. But interrupt me if you have any, any questions. Um, okay, the next question is, what are the inputs and the outputs of the program? So uh, we're getting a set of instances that we're going to operate on. We're getting the images themselves, and we're getting the, uh, the background for each camera. Um, I haven't put any outputs here because I'm assuming there's much more of the program here. So this foreground image is probably going into some other step which does more computation. Okay, so the jargon um, here is that we have steps of computation. This is a step of computation. We have items are the data. We have producer and consumer relationships. Uh, we view these arrows and any arrows that would be going out, say on this side, um, as producer and consumer uh, relations, it's just that the producer or the consumer in this case is the environment. So the environment is producing essentially an image. <coughs> so um, these are tags of control, and we have tag components. So camera number is a tag component, image number is another tag component. And this relationship is called a prescription relationship. So. Um, if there is a camera number, image number, uh, uh, say 2 comma 7, here that prescribes the uh, existence of a background subtraction task 2 comma 7. Uh, this just shows you what the uh, code within a step uh, looks like. Um, so we have uh, the step name. Um, it takes in a tag, which is the tag of the instance. Um, there's some serial code, which I've bundled up here in this uh, function. Um, it takes, it does a get to get in an item, um, and the tag of the item it gets is a function of its own tag. Um, uh, so this background thing is just getting the camera number of the, uh, of the tag here. The, ta the instance tag here is a camera number and a... Um, an image number. Um, it produces an item, does a put. Oops, I thought there was one more thing to say there. I guess not. Okay. Um, so this is an example that shows a little bit more about how the tags work, because that is a thing that's a little different um, uh, in this language. So we have a face detection algorithm. Uh, an image comes in, and it has a number of different classifiers. Um, the way this works is instead of doing one analysis that determines whether or not there's a face there, uh, the community has, the face detection community has divided it into a number of different uh, classifiers, um, and the idea is to very quickly determine if something is not a face. Um, so you look at uh, each window and determine if it might be a face based on, for instance, does it have eyes uh, or anything that might be an eye. Um, and then for those things that look like they might have eyes, it doesn't have a nose, um, you know, et cetera. Uh, so I'm just using a pictorial uh, image here of, uh, a pictorial of an image. Um, so in fact, uh, we look for a face not only in the image as a whole, but in windows of the image. And so we're looking in each of those sub-windows. Uh, and you apply classifier one to each of these uh, sub-windows and for, uh, and the, the 
the number of, of windows um, comes in from the outside. I mean, that's a constant. For uh, some of these windows, classifier 1 determines that it might be a face in that window. Um, and for each one of these, we have a prescription relation with classifier 2. So for each one of these sub-windows, we're going to execute classifier 2. Some of those pass classifier 2. Um, and for those, we're going to say uh, we're going to run classifier 3. Um, and if it comes out the other end of a long trail of these, then uh, it's determined to be a face. Um, so, and there might be, of course, uh, many images. That was just one image. Um, so, oops, sorry. Uh, so we're going to draw this uh, in this way. This is a tag space. We're calling T1, T2, T3, et cetera. <coughs> so T3 is a subset of T2. This is a subset of T1 in this case. Um, but uh, I should say at this point, I noticed a paper um, about C omega that was called Programming with triangles and rectangles and circles kind of jumped out at me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, let's see. Uh, oh, so what are the constraints on the, on the parallelism here? Um, you can do all the images in parallel. This doesn't say anything about uh, not doing the images in parallel. Um, and you can do a d number of different windows in parallel. The only constraint is that a specific window has to pass classifier 1 before it gets to execute classifier 2. Um, so this um, graph here is telling us only that that order is required. Um, and that's all it's saying. Uh, so we have a textual form of this graph. Uh, so the steps were circles, <coughs> items, uh, data items are boxes, and the control tags are triangles. And uh, these are the, as similar as we can get them, uh, the textual versions of those. Uh, so we write one line uh, for each relationship in the graph. This is a prescription relation which says the T1 prescribes classifier 1, a consumer relation that the image um, is input to classifier 1, etc. Um, and the tags have types, so we define uh, tag T0, uh, which is of type int um, and a window type. Um, and then each of these uh, has a tag which is of that type. Uh, so I want to show now, here's another <coughs> example, which um, um, is a, a tree-based uh, example. Uh, so this is sort of, you can think of it as the divide in a divide and conquer um, algorithm. So dynamically, uh, you're going to go through and create all these different uh, nodes. And associated with each node, uh, there's going to be a, uh, a tag and a step that does the computation on the input at that node. Uh, and the root values are coming in from uh, the environment. Uh, and we devise a, a scheme for labeling these. Uh, you start out with the top. Uh, this is the left child of the top, the right child of the top. This is the left child of the left child of the top, etc. cetera, uh, just so we can have some unique um, tagging. Uh, and this is, would be a static version of that um, uh, dynamic tree. So I'd like to uh, introduce the execution model. So that was sort of how you write a static program. Um, in this language. Um, and the um, execution model you can think of as instances of, um, uh, of these objects acquiring attributes. Uh, these are the runtime attributes that uh, determine what state it's in. And so we have a step that's doing divide. And this, as an instance, is tagged with TRR. Um, it's uh, prescribed by uh, divide tag. Um, with the tag TRR, and it takes in as input the divide item. Um, when this tag is available, which is one of the attributes, um, then this step becomes prescribed. Uh, that means it's going to execute. Uh, when this item becomes available, um, then this step has its inputs available, which is another one of the attributes. Uh, and when the step is both inputs available and prescribed, and it's enabled, and it can execute. Uh, when it executes, 
Um, it might produce a divide item. Uh, this is the child, the right child uh, of this node, and this is the left child of that node. Um, and in addition, it produces two tags, which indicate that the appropriate steps to, um, to process these two items are going to execute. Um, and when these items, uh, when this step executes, then these items become available. They just have that attribute. And when these items are available, of course, the process can start again. So that's not necessarily how a given runtime system will execute, but that's um, how you think about the semantics of the program. So the, um, uh, the state of a program is uh, described by the, uh, the forward propagation. Uh, well, the state is the, uh, just the set of objects that have any attribute. and um, uh, and what their attributes are. Um, but the forward propagation um, leads to enabling of the steps. And there's a backward propagation also that does some um, garbage collection. Um, and the execution frontier is the set of all instances that have some attribute um, and yet are not uh, garbage. So it's the things that we're interested in right now. Uh, and termination happens when all the steps that are prescribed have completed. You can write an invalid, an invalid program in which um, you can't do anything else, and yet there are prescribed steps that can't run. Uh, there's certain properties that I'd like to point out. One is that it's this dynamic single assignment. So you can produce uh, an item once. Um, it's not modified. Um, the steps have no side effects uh, except to produce items and tags. Uh, they are short-lived in that they take their input, they execute, um, they put their output out, and then they die. They don't sit there um, and take more input and produce more output. Uh, and you can freely re-execute them in that um, the result will be the same every time. Uh, and there are no race conditions there. So um, here's an example we worked with uh, uh, some people at, uh, at CMU. It doesn't matter really what this application is, but I'll show you in the next slide or two. Um, and um, we, uh, it has to do with uh, vision application using stem cell, uh, stem cell growth. Um, and they had a paper describing their serial algorithm. Um, and uh, they used slightly different notation, but basically it looked a lot like this. They had producers and, and consumers, and they identified data structures, and, um, and they identified computations. So we started out with this. It turns out they had some errors, which happens when you try to make something more precise. You find some errors, you know. They <laughs> um, so, uh, not in the implementation of the algorithm, I think, but in the way they described it in their, you know, loosely uh, generated figure in the in the paper. Um, I am, I'm not sure that it was actually reflected in the uh, actual work, although I'm not sure about that. Um, okay. So uh, the first question we have to ask is, what are the inputs and the outputs here? So images are coming in, uh, and final states are going out. It turns out that in addition, there's a, hist there's a loop here that concerns the histogram, involves a histogram. And so you needed an initial value of the histogram. And so there's one uh, histogram that's coming in as well. Um, the next question is, how do you distinguish among the instances? And it turned out that, by and large, um, they were all distinguished by uh, a value, most of them were distinguished by a value uh, k, which is what they use for their uh, image number. Um, and the uh, image number is coming in from outside. And there's a prescription relation with, um, with every step here that's prescribed by uh, K. Yeah? So there's feedback cycles here. Yeah, so this is not all parallel. They're actually iterating and going to some sort of fixed point? Or? Um, 
what happens is, as the, uh, as I understand it, as the images go through, um, they're images of something happening over time. So they're taking a, a picture of the same thing over time, and so they get a prediction about what's going to happen in the next slide from wh what happened in the previous one, and it helps them get better results. Uh, I see. So I should think of the loop as comparing previous iteration. Right. 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 Exactly. Um, so, okay. So there were two. Um, there were two steps here, which are not prescribed just by K, and it turns out that uh, they're distinguished by K and a particular cell in the image. This is a, uh, a stem cell um, in the image, and. Uh, and so these two need a prescription that is different from this guy. Uh, so we have to know what are the instances of this that we're going to execute. Um, and it's going to have the same shape, that is, the same two uh, tag components. Uh, and then the question is, well, what step here determines um, what these instances are? Um, and it, ter it turns out that the arbitrator initial uh, part of its uh, function is to figure out what the um, what the cells are, uh, and it turns out here that the arbitrator final determines what these cells are, um, and that was all we had to ask him. Okay, once we got this straight, uh, we didn't have to talk about anything else. We were able to put together a T-Streams program, which does exactly this, and we had little stubs that say, your code goes here. Um, we couldn't look at their code, <laughs> but we could execute our code, um, and it did all the right things. Um, but the point is that there was no mention of parallelism anywhere in this discussion with him. It's all what is, you know, who produces what, who decides what instances there are. Uh, parallelism doesn't come into play. Um, and so that's the big message here. Were there any questions on that? So just as a uh, to compare, there's so much work in the embedded system community on data flow programming. How would you compare no. this, uh, the T-streams -stream, T abstraction to data flow? Um, T-streams I think of as it has its roots in data flow, in tuple spaces, and in streaming. Um, so the explicit tuple space, um, I think, is one difference. And the other distinction is not only that these, um, uh, you know, items and, and, and steps are tagged, but we have these tag spaces as first-class objects um, that um, allow you to say what you're going to execute without saying, at this stage, when you're going to execute it. Um, so it really makes a huge distinction between uh, what the programmer knows, which is what needs to be executed, and what are the inputs and outputs, and what we care about um, when we uh, map that to an actual system. Kath, all the examples you have so far have relatively persistent index spaces, but I guess any action could make up a whole new index space. Absolutely, absolutely. Whatever it wants. So <laughs> right. Um, Well, it's not array-like in that uh, it's that you explicitly are manipulating the tags. Um, so, sure. Uh, well, can you synthesize them entirely? Uh, you know, I'm an action, and I emit uh, a bunch of things, and I just choose to number them 0 through n, or I choose to call red, green, and blue. It doesn't really matter as long as the triangle I emit and the square I admit. Have this yeah. match up, right, exactly. Nothing else. Exactly, exactly. So um, you do need to be able to write the types. The, yeah, yeah. the types come through, they're the, the glue that connects the underlying serial language to the T-Streams world. Um, but, yeah, Gideon? From 30,000 feet, the separation between domain expert and, and uh, performance effect looks very much like what they do in the database business, where they have a database administrator who understands only performance. Yes. <laughs> that's a great that's a great analogy. I hadn't thought of that one.
that makes sense, right? Uh, well, the condition is embodied in the step that produces the tag, essentially. That's what the condition is. Um, but I think the problem with Linda is, I understand Linda, is more that um, the, the computations are long-lived. So they, um, they do some computation, they put out some data, they're still sitting there. That data gets used by something else, which produces more data, which then the initial computation we were talking about takes in. Now, if we're really going to worry about performance, then we'd like to be able to take those two instances of the computation and map them either to parallel computations or to run on different um, uh, processors because we're you know, doing locality, locality optimization or um, whatever. So it's the flexible ability to place these finer grain uh, computations that uh, I think is more key. I just, to, in any stream program, you never have any uh, race conditions, is that correct? I mean, in that construction, you want to uh, have basically kind of deterministic behavior. Right, right. So any race condition. Right. So there, are, okay. so there are things like interrupts or testing the absence of inputs that uh, fundamentally you've decided to avoid to, in order to have that nice property. Right. So there is this environment. Um, so there are no constraints on the environment. <laughs> okay. So this piece, which is the T-streams piece, is functional. Um, it's deterministic. Um, but we don't have anything to say about what goes on in the other part of it. As, as in functional languages equipped with streams, though, there is a, a sort of a primitive notion of state that you get by the feedback loops. You've got one up there. So the state of the program is the um, the set of items and the set of tags that you have at any given time. But I can have the next the next set of items and tags depend on the current set. Absolutely, uh, absolutely, absolutely. So those of you who study functional languages, streams and the streaming capabilities, this is the, this is the, of that book. Okay. Anything else? Okay, I'll show you these cool pictures. So there, <laughs> this is, the, I love this picture. Um, uh, these stem cells are supposed to turn into bone, um, and what they're doing is devising um, and building a specific piece, piece of, of uh, skull that they're going to put in here. And they do that by inkjet printing a sequence of two-dimensional layers of the stem cells and a growth factor, and the growth factor with exactly the right concentrations determines the shape of the um, of the bone and what they're trying to learn in this previous experiment is how in fact the growth factor um, impacts uh, that and so what they're doing is looking frame after frame and seeing uh, for a given uh, growth factor uh, concentration uh, what cells split and what cells die and what cells move and you know all of this stuff uh, the reason they were, one reason they were particularly interested in T-streams is that it has this flexible parallel um, execution model where you could take the current experiments that they were doing um, and do them in soft real time and with any available resources we could address their backlog. Um, so um, I call this a model and I just want to say a few words about that. Um, there are two reasons, one is syntax and one is semantics. Um, I'm not that ex interested in having big discussions about the syntax. So we have a graphical form, a textual form, we have a C++ binding, uh, we've looked into pragmas, you know, it's really the fundamental aspects of the language that I care about. Furthermore, even with respect to semantics, we've made um, a couple of different trade-offs uh, for different instances of this. And the trade-offs are among ease of use, performance, generality, elegance, whatever. But, so there seems to be a class of languages here. Um, and at this stage, um, 
you know, concerned about exploring the class. Um, you know, I, I, I'm hoping that we'll zero in on a small number of these and, you know, one or two of these, I don't know, or, or maybe we'll keep it as a family. Um, so we've uh, done this part. Um, I'd like to talk now about the flexibility of this uh, next phase. Once you have a T-Streams program, what can you do with it? Um, and the flexibility involves three things. Uh, the type of parallelism uh, that you can exploit, the mapping styles, and the target architectures. Uh, so um, this is the type of parallelism. Uh, we have uh, three different kinds of computation. We have some instances of foo, some instances of bar, and some instances of baz. Um, and uh, this is the T-stream specification. If we assume each box here represents a resource and we map them to the hardware this way, then we get instances of foo that can execute in parallel, followed by instances of, of bar and instances of baz, so it's loop or data parallelism. Um, and if you prefer, you can map them this way. Um, you get... Um, all the instances of foo on one resource, all the instances of bar on another one, uh, you get task parallelism. Um, if you have a slightly different uh, application, which actually has some data dependencies, uh, and you uh, map them this way, you get uh, loop or data parallelism. And if you map them this way, you get pipeline parallelism. So with the same specification, just with different mappings, um, the domain expert uh, doesn't have to worry about uh, what the target is, um, and the flexibility is there for the performance expert. Uh, with respect to mapping styles, there are basically three different uh, problems we need to address. One is choosing the grain. Um, another is choosing the distribution among the resources. And the last one is choosing a schedule within a resource. Um, we can do them all statically, in which case you can get um, a data parallelism, task parallelism, and pipeline parallelism statically within the same uh, execution. We can do them all dynamically. Um, we can do uh, static grain and distribution uh, with a dynamic schedule. Um, and we can do static grain and dynamic distribution and schedule. There are probably other ones. Um, but uh, it turns out that we did uh, one of these at HP. Uh, we did one of these at HP. The Intel one currently looks like this. And I have a Georgia Tech student who's looking at uh, dynamic grain. So whatever you want, <laughs> basically. Uh, so this is a question of the target architectures. I think it's pretty clear that you can do um, distributed memory and shared memory just by looking at the producer-consumer relationships, either as synchronization or as uh, communication. So I picked two a little more unusual architectures. This is a, um, uh, a GPU. So let's assume uh, that our previous uh, implementation, we had a bucket of enabled steps. So it might have red steps and blue steps and green steps and foo steps and bar steps. And anything that's enabled is in there, and a processor can just go pick one out. Uh, for GPU, what we'd like to do is have a distinct bucket for the blue steps and the red steps, et cetera. Um, and now when the GPU is ready to run, um, we can look at the buckets at runtime and decide that maybe this bucket is a better one to execute at the moment. Um, take this bucket of steps, which are guaranteed now to all be enabled and to all be of the same type, um, and ship them over to the GPU. Um, and so I believe that the languages that um, are currently designed for GPU specifically um, require that in the static code you get to some place where you know what static operation you're doing. So I think this is a little more flexible. Um, we don't have this, we do not have this implemented. Um, uh, if you look at ILP, um, you might have a blue step that you've um, uh, compiled for instruction level parallelism, and this one has a tag B. Uh, you might have a red step that's compiled for instruction level parallelism uh, with a tag IJ without knowing anything uh, much about these two. Um, 
you can compile a third step, which is a red-blue step, um, which assumes in its compilation that the red step and the blue step are totally independent, uh, although it doesn't know what specific steps they are, and it knows it will have a tag, uh, vij. Uh, and then at runtime, when uh, there's a red step and a blue step that's ready to execute, it just picks one out and executes the red-blue step. And if there's only a red step ready and not a blue step, then it can execute the red step. So we don't have that implemented either. <laughs> um, okay, so we have, uh, to sum up the flexibility, we have uh, loop and data uh, task and pipeline parallelism. We have dynamic and static uh, mapping styles, and we have a wide variety of architectures. Uh, we're also looking at, well, I guess we did some of that. Oh, and uniprocessors. Um, what you get here is flexibility and scheduling. So you can um, uh, use this whole thing to optimize for the memory hierarchy. Um, so the goal, um, as I said, was to be an interface between the domain expert and the performance expert. And what we need to show for that is that the domain expert doesn't need any knowledge of parallelism. Uh, that the uh, performance expert has what they need to do um, to optimize for performance. Uh, so the last thing is our current implementation. I'm not a C++ programmer, so I'm hoping there aren't too many questions here. <laughs> um, uh, so this is just a quick sort example. Um, what you have to look for are the places where the serial code uh, interacts with uh, with other code, so where uh, you know where, where this code interacts with its environment. Uh, so there's the arguments and return values. Uh, here it's doing a return. Here it's doing a return. Uh, here are two calls uh, to itself with arguments. Um, and so, although the body of the code uh, doesn't change, we um, uh, we change uh, this line to indicate what the tag is. We do gets of the uh, incoming data. Uh, then we're going to compute the tag of the left child, um, put out the item of the left child. Here's a separate item, which is just the size of that item. Uh, and then we also have to put out a tag of the left child to indicate we want to process that data. And we do the same thing for the right, um, and then return. Uh, so there's no direct interaction of this code with its environment, with you know, there's no call return thing going on here. Yeah, so this is the left child and this is the right child as, you know, this, whoops. Yeah, that's the left child and the right child, exactly. Okay, the synchronization is that we have put out into the T-Streams world uh, this uh, data item, and we've put out a tag that says process that data item. Uh, so back a number of slides. I don't know if I can go back there. In the runtime model where I said when this uh, tag is available and when the inputs are available, then the step can execute. It's enabled. Um, so that's the synchronization. It, it can't run until those things are happening. Okay. Your tree property lets you do reference counting and perhaps say, you know, once I get yeah. this input, I could destructively overwrite it. So yeah, so you wouldn't really want it. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's a good question. Um, um, so we have dynamic single assignment right now. 
So uh, right now we are assuming that there's copying going on. Um, what does the dynamic single assignment property buy you? It buys you a couple of characteristics. One of them is no race conditions and you know exactly which value you're, you're looking at. But there are times where you want to do something uh, in place. So we're trying to uh, look at extending dynamic single assignment to, f to figure out exactly what the, uh, what is it that will give us those nice properties, um, you know, without throwing out the baby with the bathwater, as <laughs> one of my colleagues is fond of saying. Um, and it's looking right now, although this, I'm not going to commit to this, um, like you're required to have a lattice structure. You're required to make forward progress. Um, and anything that makes forward progress in where you can identify the nodes in the lattice. So um, in particular, a tree is a lattice. And so um, you could, in place, um, do this with the, with the right mechanism. And we're working on that at the moment. Um, so one of the arguments goes like this. Um, I think Jim asked last night, so how do you know when you're finished with the old values before you create the new values? Well, we have to know right now, um, when we create a value uh, and we garbage collect it, we have to know when all of the uses have occurred um, and before we do garbage collection. Um, and so by similar mechanism, we can know when all the uses of a particular instance have occurred before we make a transition to the next point in the lattice. So we're looking at generalizing dynamic single assignment basically to solve. The thing that made CISL fast ah. was worked by uh, graduate students at Colorado State University in Canada. We did an update in place analysis and then we had a lot of people in the last uses and okay, write that down. <laughs> How do you spell his name? <laughs> What's his name last name? Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. I have no idea where name is now, but that thesis had so subtle. Probably already know, but I mean, but it really made a huge difference. Oh, sure, sure. So we'd like, the, the dilemma in that is we would like to maintain all the simplicity of this. Um, and, you know, we, we don't want to get that at the expense of the simplicity because we are after this wider audience. So. Uh, okay. So we look at the calls. Okay, so we convert it to that. Um, then we take the uh, textual representation of the graph. Um, we take this new version of the steps, um, and we have a translator which creates some boilerplate, um, sticks this into the boilerplate, um, and that's the generated application. And that's the whole deal. Um, so in the future, we'd like some other applications, some other implementations, <laughs> maybe C sharp. Um, <laughs> pardon, F sharp? That would be nice. Um, so we'd like to have a mechanism for reuse, um, you know, either a la frameworks, kind of the larger skeletons, the uh, subgraphs or graph structures, uh, also reuse of steps. Um, and any combination of the two. Um, and as I was just saying, I'd like to generalize the dynamic single assignment form. Um, this is just some technical history. I don't know. I guess I'll say this. The data optimization work was uh, work on the um, connection machine uh, for uh, locality. Uh, that work led to the subspace model, um, which um, kind of is the background for, uh, for this. In the subspace model, we uh, uh, based it on um, uh, static single assignment form. But after I finished uh, that work, uh, 
uh, I went back to readdress the static single assignment form because it really wasn't adequate to the task. Um, um, it was a weak foundation, and the array static single assignment form is a much better, stronger foundation for these kinds of programs. Um, then we did, from based on this, weak dynamic single assignment form, and at the same time I was working with some people from Georgia Tech on this streaming, uh, support for streaming uh, media applications. Um, and it had a notion of uh, tags of time, which were monotonically increasing. Um, and I realized that a combination of these two and this would give us something much better than both of them. Um, and in fact, that's uh, what led to, uh, to T-Streams. And this is uh, some NSF work based on that. So that's the whole thing. Yeah. Then you have to check, can you meet payroll? It's a big thing that changes everything afterwards. How do you, can, you, can you fit that into your model? Sure, if you can, you can do a reduction is what you're doing. So can you, so you, you, you have to then add up the, yes. you, you add them all up. Sure. And payroll will give the back. Yeah, so you, you can have loops in these, um, uh, in these uh, graphs and you can input um, all instances of an item into a single step, or you can do a reduction in a more efficient way um, and decide whether or not you're going to make payroll, and then you um, omit um, a thumbs up or thumbs down. Um, but that's no problem. So in those tag specifiers that say when something is runnable? Uh, if something <coughs> is to run, not when. Um, okay, so what I showed there was just the divide part of the divide and conquer. Right. And in the divide and conquer, you have a mirror image of that, basically, that's doing the conquer part, that's putting it all together. Um. Right, and so you have to have, essentially, you know, if you're going to put two things back together, you need to know, for example, if they're adjacent or something. Right. So that requires that you be able to say that um, I want two tags where either, you know, they have, that, that are the same except for this one has a zero bit here and this has a one, or that there's this arithmetic relationship between them, or some, something that relates the two together, and that's what I was seeing in these presumably simplified specifications that we see on the screen. So, uh, I'm not sure if you, yeah, tags are first, you can, you can compute tags, yeah. Sparse index sets, perhaps, right? I mean, that's the worst thing you could have after the first step. So you count how many are in each one, and you get a new set of indices, zero up to each one. Right. You just and then that plus one up to the top, and you gather those things respectively, and now you're off to the next thing. That's a way. I mean, you can compute new tags. You can, you can absolutely compute tags, and you can. Okay, so, so basically it happens on the output side then. If you're willing to compute where something goes, then yeah, you would have that works. Right, if you yeah. need to match together where two things come from, that's perhaps more difficult. But in this case, I, I agree, you can just produce the output text. So maybe we should talk offline about this question of where they come from. I'm not sure I understand that yet, but um, well, that sounds like it might yeah, be interesting. Right now, it's just a flat map. It's on the input side, right? And can you do higher order requirements for the input? Yeah, no higher orders that were just for the side. I work on a different system here that, that relies on um, um, essentially um, specifying relations between tags to to produce a dynamic specification for the input vector to these um, what you call steps. Uh, 
Okay. And yeah, uh, that does sound interesting. Right now we're assuming a forward flow um, and um, the, the tags of the input are computable only from the tag of the step. The tags of the output are computable from anything, uh, the input data. Um, we've looked at the possibility of a demand-driven execution, which would require uh, essentially that the, the producer also be uh, computable, or we could do it best under those conditions. Um, but I'm not sure that's what you're talking about either. Interesting analogies to the opposite of fee functions. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> right, right. I mean, it sort of comes from. It comes from, yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Can, can you say a few words about applications, or is it? We don't have a lot of applications. I've moved around a bit, if you've noticed. So, uh, that's been one problem. Um, we are trying to focus on uh, on image applications at the moment, um, but there's, I mean, there. Are, a lot of applications that would be totally appropriate. Uh, you know, we have a few fairly small ones, um, and largely they were um, designed to to test out, you know, particular facilities that we have. Um, we're looking at making this available uh, to the public fairly soon, so we're going to need applications. Um, if you have any suggestions or um, volunteers. <laughs> um, let me know. Any other questions? Just think, yeah.